Yeah, thank you all for, for joining. Um, uh, this is pretty cool. This is not something I've done before, but I did want to mention, and one is I tend to talk fast, and I apologize in advance. I'll try to slow down. Um, Beth and Stephen are really great growers, the folks who are going to be hosting next week's uh, webinar, and um, it would, they would bring a lot of value to the topic. They've been growing for a long time. They do a great job, and they're really dialed in. They're very thoughtful folks, and they have a very sharp pencil. Um, so I want to give a shout out to Beth. Um, so I wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about the history of our farm. Um, this was where we landed in 1998, um, and we started farming there in 1999. We had no infrastructure to speak of. Um, at the time, we had about an acre of land that we were working. We ultimately bumped it up to about two and a half acres. Um, we had worked on a five acre, very intensive uh, hand driven farm, and then we had worked on a 20 acre wholesale truck farm um, that was highly mechanized. And we started our own farm, tried to bring some of those best of the of both pieces together um, by growing a higher, higher amount of uh, individual crops but try to mechanize them when we could. Um, and we quickly ran into some challenges. The first one being just the physical location of where we had chosen to start the farm. We were at 1200 feet and um, very snowy, very slow to warm up in the spring, um, severely drained in August. And um, one of the things that we quickly realized from coming to a market that for us started the first week of May was that there was very little time in that production season to develop enough vegetables and enough product to have a full display at the market. So we tried doing root overwintered root teller stuff and potatoes, and um, we had a lot of very slow, low sales days um, our first few seasons. And we were paying attention to what other growers were doing and noticed that they were bringing some plants. And so we figured, well, we could probably bring some plants um, and kind of slowly, incrementally increased the amount of plants that we brought to the market. One of the things that was really nice about that is that because of the weather swings that we can get, as soon as we would put the plants out into the field, even with Remay, they were out of our care and all kinds of calamities would be born upon them. And then we would have lost all the work that went into getting those transplants out. And so by shifting the focus of that time of the year into a greenhouse. It was a more protective environment and we could kind of be in control of a few more variables. It took a lot of pressure off of us, both uh, just logistically and also emotionally of not having to have the anxiety of all these seedlings out in the ground ahead of the time when they typically would have been planted to get them to market on time so we can be competitive with our neighbors. Um, where we are, even just as many as uh, five or 10 miles north or south can make a huge difference in a microclimate. And we were, we were in this market and some of our other farmers were zones ahead of where we were and we were never going to be the first one at market. So by bringing the production into the greenhouse in that part of the year, we were able to show up on May, May 1st, whatever the first Saturday of May was and be kind of at a full force. So in about 2006, one of the major plant growers at the, at the market that we attended uh, was kind of contracting his uh, business a little bit and walked away from the farmer's market. And we had the opportunity to really kind of crank up our operation. And so we started to spend a lot more time developing the plant sale part of our business um, and grew it into what it became um, just until a couple of years ago. And so our first greenhouse was a 17 by 48. And I think that you can see this cursor. And so it was basically in this area here. And I still remember when we first put up the greenhouse feeling like we had so much room and it was gonna last us for a long time. And it quickly became apparent um, that it was this totally inadequate size and we needed to put up a bigger one. And so we cited a 21 by 48 foot greenhouse and then added another 22 by 48 for uh, tomato production and had uh, a cold frame on side of the plant house um, that was helpful. It allowed us to harden the plants off and get them to market and be ready to go on the ground, but it was logistically complicated. And um, I ended up going to like the auction that everyone tells their grandchildren about 
where um, it was a wholesale nursery that had gone out of business and I bought $2,000 worth of stuff and probably paid 10 cents on the dollar. Um, I was able to get a 22 by 148 foot greenhouse for $600. And that included the heater and all the pipe, uh, all the wiring was in conduit. Um, and I also got a 14 by 140 foot, foot greenhouse for $400. <clears throat> so I brought them home and took some things down and put up the 14 foot greenhouse and used that as a cold frame so I could harden off the plants and on benches. It was, and it kind of allowed us to then flex out to the next level. Um, we had been using propane as our heating source. It was a really easy way to kind of get started. You didn't have to buy the equipment. Um, you didn't have to buy the tank anyway. Um, the heaters are much less expensive and you didn't have to worry about spills with an oil tank. Um, you also didn't have to put the propane tank in the greenhouse um, and use the space that would have been held by an oil burner. It wasn't as efficient as fuel oil, but it was cheaper for us to get started. Um, and so, through using these greenhouses, we were able to kind of turn up the weekly sales to topping out about $2,000 a week from the beginning of May um, and beginning at about $2,000 a week. And during Memorial Day weekend, um, we would often be doing $4,000 a week in sales of seedlings. Um, and for us, Memorial Day weekend is kind of like the typical frost-free date when people are getting their, their gardens in the ground. Um, so it it became a significant part of our business. Um, so let me do this. So we heat with wood. Um, we have a wood boiler that we installed in 2010. Um, we got away from, from propane and from fuel companies in 2010. And uh, this uses 24 inch cord wood. Uh, it's 176,000 BTU burner and it runs through piping underground uh, and then it's through these powered modines that are 100,000 100, BTU outlet. Um, they can heat the greenhouses typically to about 65 or 70 degrees at night. We open them incrementally as the season goes on. So while it's 22 by a 60 foot greenhouse now, the, um, we drop a false wall like an interior plastic panel. So when it's the coldest part of the season. It's really just a 22 by, say, a 20, 28 foot greenhouse. Um, we typically burn about six to seven cords of wood, and we replace about a thousand gallons of propane with that wood. Um, so there are certainly parts of the puzzle using wood that are more complicated. It's heavy, and um, you have to think at least a year ahead. Um, it is still something that can be run on the thermostat and um, kind of takes care of itself as long as you keep it in good wood. Um, there's a, a, a video on the YouTube that I did. This unit was helped, uh, University of Vermont helped to defray some of the cost of this unit and they did a study, um, their engineering department did a study. And so there's actually a video on the YouTube that talks a little bit more about that. So I won't dig into that too deeply, but um, all, of, <clears throat> all of the plants that we were running again, we're going through these two greenhouses. So it's a 22 by 60 foot main house. It's a double poly, it's inflated, 100,000 BTUs heat. Um, and then the adjacent cold frame is 14 feet by 48 feet. Um, and it has a single layer of poly. There's no heat except for supplemental heat when uh, I really need to take the edge off. Um, but I really want the plants to be in there and get used to being outside and hardened off so that when our customers come to get them, they can take them home and stick them in the ground and they'll, they'll successfully make that transition. There won't be any shock. Um, and then we also have the ability to have lots of plants kind of overflowing all where, all into the barnyard and um, between the greenhouses and tucked into places. And um, so we have lots of space that's unconditioned to take care of the plants as well. So we choose uh, to put everything into plastic. A lot of folks in our area really like to make the soil blocks. Um, and I worked at a farm where we used soil blocks on the on-farm production for the plants and they would be transplanted on the farm. But the logistics of moving them around was um, just too much. And so we really wanted something that was uh, transferable and could handle getting moved around and taken to market. And when people would buy them, they would be able to take them home and not be like spilling soil all over our site and you know at the market and so 
we have a couple different sizes that we use. So for the 806s, we put all of our lettuce mixes, all of our brassicas. We do some flowers, although we weren't allowed to, to, to bring them to the market. So that was just for on-farm sales. And then we also use an 806 deep for plants like basils and peppers. And so the deep is about a half an inch taller than a standard 806 liner. And that extra amount of soil really made a huge difference in both the basil and the peppers. The basil specifically because we were seeding three to four seeds per cell and um, all that mass was a really heavy draw on the amount of soil that was in a regular 806. And um, the extra bit of soil made a really nice beautiful plant. And for the peppers, the um, extra amount of soil allowed me to hold those peppers for a longer amount of time and still have them look good for sale because um, we only potted peppers on just the once. Um, and I see some questions, but I'll get to them at the end. Um, the 804, all of our tomatoes, cucurbits, and herb mixes go into the 804. Um, it's a larger cell and it allows a couple things. One, it's a larger root mass. And so for quicker growing things like tomatoes and squashes, um, it kind of slows them down a little bit. Also the increased surface area um, disincentivizes them from like crowding and growing up really fastly, uh, really fastly, really quickly, where you would have, um, they'd be kind of racing to catch the light. Having the extra room allows them to slow down and make a stockier plant. Um, it also allows the cucurbit seeds to kind of find their way out of that cell and not be cramped inside of a regular 806. We also do some beets and spinach and scallions, and these are all multi-seeded cells. So two to three beets, two to three spinach, six to seven scallions. Um, and the intention is that they're planted as a clump. And so this smaller cell allows the smaller amount of root volume that those plants create to hold the cell together, hold the plug together. Um, and they also don't need any more room than that. Um, and it also has the advantage of being a 12 pack as opposed to an eight pack uh, in the cell. So I'm getting more uh, retail value for these than I am for an 806 or an 804. And then lastly, we use a 1203. Um, and these I use for the onions and leeks and shallots. Um, the goal is to have between 35 and 40 plants um, at the point of sale. And so by filling these cells, each one has you know, 10 to 15 seeds in it, um, or 10 to 15 plants in it, excuse me. And so when the customer comes to go plant them, they pop the cell out and get it really wet, and the soil just kind of falls apart and it makes a really nice plant. They don't really swirl, they don't grow into each other, and it's, it, it's a nice way to bring healthy seeds to the market for folks. We had the advantage of having Vermont Compost Company uh, about 25 minutes down the road. And that uh, has been a really nice thing for us. We don't have to worry about making our own potting mix. And we also have the advantage for us that the potting mix is much less of a variable. Um, Carl Hammer wakes up every day kind of thinking about ways to make the best potting mix um, and some of the best compost. And so I can leave that responsibility to him um, and focus on every all the other things that we do. I used to receive it in a, a dump truck would come and drop eight or nine yards and I would fill grain sacks and put them into the woodshed and let them freeze um, and then bring them into the greenhouse as needed. Um, and then I visited a friend who had a big fl uh, flat filler um, where he would load the hopper and then the hopper would agitate it and you could mix water in if you needed to. And um, the soil would then auger up and fall into the flats. Um, and he was a really high volume operation and kind of needed all that extra. But I um, didn't have the $4,000 that this machine costs. And I also didn't have the footprint inside the greenhouse to house this machine. Um, but my biggest takeaway was that the, the machine was really just lifting the soil up and then filling the flats. And so I figured that I have an abundance of gravity on my farm. And what I was really looking to do was to have a way to get the soil above the flats. And so by filling these bins and then using the forks on the front of the tractor, I can bring them into the greenhouse. It's stacked on a stack of pallets. 
or it's rested on the a stack of pallets, so it's very stable. And then this little bench here slides into the front of the pallet. Uh, it's adjustable by height because it can fit into any one of the pallets. And then I put these flats on here, rake the soil out, and then smooth it over. Um, and then use this press plate to press it down and get a good compaction. And I can fill these two flats with soil in literally like 40 seconds. It goes really fast. Um, and so it, it, even if you're bringing home soil in a bale or a bushel or you're buying it in bags from a local provider or making it yourself, I would anything that you can do to explore lifting the soil up to above where you're filling the flats, um, I highly recommend spending a little bit of time about that. Um, I used to shovel them and do all these different kinds of things, and I just really like this. We just have lots of gravity, and it's nice to make it work for us. So this board here that's pushing it down is this board right here. I have them for all the different pl uh, flat shapes and profiles that I use. Once they're compressed and on the seating bench, this flat here, I used to dibble the marks where the seeds are going to go. Um, this one has two on it, so I can put in extra seeds and use the plants that all are emerging to fill any misses that are in the flat. So that way I'm always bringing a full flat of plants to my customers. Um, it takes a little bit of time to do the pricking out or the pulling the seeds out. Um, and if I was doing like a lot and a lot of one or two things, it would make sense to do filler trays and just kind of pop out soils and, and put them in. But I'm doing a couple of this and a couple of that and a couple of this. And so this is the best way for me to have the plants that I need kind of like at the place where I need them. Um, and it's just, it's it has just the way that I've managed it and it works pretty well. So once the flats are getting filled, um, we need to know which ones we're going to be making. And so on the computer, I keep a list of all the flats, all the varieties that are needing to be generated for the weeks ahead. Um, this sheet lives on the computer. I print it out and bring it into the greenhouse so that anyone can uh, know what we're looking for for the week. Um, it has the amount of trays that we need to build by their size. Um, so that can be done by one person and then the other person can start to build them. Um, any kind of special instructions, um, varieties that I'm looking for in these mix packs is, uh, how many seeds are going in this, what size cell, it's all kind of noted in here. And then any problems that are happening can be noted here by this one, I needed more tags. So this got circled, so it needs, it needs pot sticks, but it got seeded. And it's a way of kind of keeping track of everything. Um, Every flat that we do gets a tag. Um, I've tried really hard to make sure to remove as many barriers as I can to my customers. And so um, having to ask what this thing is, um, is a barrier and not knowing what this thing is after they bought it is also a barrier. And so we make a point of, with the exception of lettuce, every seedling, every pack that is sold has a tag in it. Um, and so these pot sticks, I got them from a company called RippedSheets.com, and they are out west. I think they're in, in Washington State. They come as they're a die cut, like a pre-stamped sheet of plastic that runs through a uh, laser printer. Um, they cost about $1.20 a sheet. There are 24 of these pot sticks on each sheet, so each one will do uh, one 804, one 806. I'm sorry, three flats. Um, you know, there's so I print out the Highledge farm side kind of as a larger group and then print out the, the variety side as, a, as they're needed. I do some preemptively and put them in these files, um, but this allows me to not have to plan super far ahead. I don't have to get my order into the company that's gonna print these out for me. I can change uh, any information I want to kind of midstream it has my website on it, all that kind of good stuff on it. Um, and then I keep them in this file so that they are neat and organized. And when someone needs to go find them, they can find them here. Um, I also have a P 
piece of paper that lets me know if I need to print anymore because I'm sometimes I'm falling back, falling behind. Um, but I looked for these for a long time as a way to make these by myself and not have to be handwriting them out. And I was super excited when I found them. And they're nice folks. They they're a dot com company, but their customer service uh, are real people and they're very helpful. Um, once they have their pot sticks on them, then they go back out into the greenhouse to grow on for a while. Um, we try to put them all into blocks of like age. So for example, all of these guys are of a similar age. They're all going to leave the greenhouse at the same time. All these guys are of the same age and they're all going to leave the greenhouse at the same time. Um, and that's been really helpful for me to kind of keep track knowing how much real estate I have to work with in the next week. It's also easier for anyone who's, who might be new or, um, Sometimes what I say doesn't make sense to everybody else, but I can say like everything in this block needs to leave the cold, needs to leave the greenhouse and go into the cold frame. And it's just a little bit easier to keep it all straight. Um, we make a point of having all the plants go out into the cold frame for at least three to five days. Um, we really want them to be hardened off. So like I said earlier, that they can go right into the ground <clears throat> and not have any kind of transplant shock. Um, Things like peppers and tomatoes get another tag, and it's these Venetian blinds right here. Um, the plants will often grow up past the pot sticks, and it's hard to see them, uh, see what the varieties are, because most of them look pretty similar. And so by using these things, I can look at them and see from a distance um, what I have, what I need when I'm loading the van, and they also go to market. So when I'm doing the marketing, I can look for them and set the stand up really quickly, and be able to measure, um, not measure, but take care of backstock and keep everything looking the way it needs to look at the stand. So when it comes to variety selection, we have a couple things. One is we try to use organic seed whenever we can. Um, we kind of, have, we have always felt that as an organic farm, having a start be from an organic seed is super important and it's a way of closing the loop. Um, so, we uh, just that there's times where they're harder to find and they're not available for every variety. And for those, we certainly make an exception, um, but we do try to use them whenever we can. We use hybrids and OPs interchangeably. If we feel like the variety is better as a hybrid, then we'll use that variety. If we feel like there's an open pollinator variety that does a great job, we'll use that one. Um, the hybrids do cost more typically. Um, but the cost of the seed is not a super high part of the cost of the of the actual product. And so I have some slides later to talk about the costing, but I kind of feel like you can still use a, a, like an expensive seed and be making a good profit from it and giving your customers a really high quality plant. Um, we have always tried to make a point of bringing varieties that are only going to thrive in the time that we're bringing them. So for example, if you were to come to our stand on the first week of May, you will not find peppers and tomatoes, uh, eggplants, and all the kind of tender crops. We start the season with onions and leeks and scallions and really hardy brassicas and lettuces and greens that can take that time of the year. As the season moves forward, we'll then start to bring the crops that can go home and go into the ground. Most of the customers, most of our gardeners in our area are somewhat fluent in season in protecting, like using remay and those kinds of things. But um, for some folks, it's the first time that they've had a garden and we wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to kind of set them up with good expectations and uh, a good success. Um, most of the varieties that we bring are varieties that we're producing on the farm for a finished vegetable. It's not always the case. There are certainly times when uh, a commercial hybrid zucchini is more than an average home grower would need in their garden. Um, I would even opine that they don't want as many zucchinis as Dunja might provide for them. Um, you know, Dunja costs $104 an M, um, and it's that would be, it would certainly still be profitable, but at the same time, it would be. We kind of push the boundaries and dark green zucchini works great in a home growing such setting. Um, we do try to find varieties that uh, will perform in our part of the world and so we need things that are a little bit more forgiving um, but we have experience with the varieties that we've been growing on the farm and 
and we also get feedback from our customers and you can also see what folks in the area are also growing. We started bringing these mixed packs um, fairly early in our career and um, they helped to drive a lot of our expansion. They, um, for any of these, there are six different varieties in each pack. And so for example, in this sweet pepper mix, you know, these are the six peppers that are available. They're all in the same pack, oh, they're all in every pack in the same order. And so this tag here represents the pot stick that's in the, the pack when you get it. So imagine you're holding it in your left hand and your thumb is where the tag is. That's how they're all laid out. And we send everybody home with one of these sheets um, that describes, you know, where that pepper is in the pack and a quick description of it. And um, people will buy one of each. Um, and they sell, we sell a lot of these. Folks really love them. It allows them to have a much more uh, diverse garden in terms of varieties without having to buy multiple, multiple plants that they don't need. Um, they certainly cost more to produce. They, um, oftentimes the seed that we're buying, we're buying it in smaller amounts, so the cost per seed goes up, um, and they require a certain level of attention when you're constructing them and managing them, and um, I have to print out these cards and cut them up and staple them and hand them to people, and so there's a lot of extra to them, but it also brings people to the booth and they might buy a couple of mixes, but then they'll also get some lettuce and some chard and some broccoli and some herbs and some all the things that don't take as much to um, produce. And uh, it's a way to drive sales for all those other things. So they make us a lot of friends. Um, and it's important that things make money on the farm, but they should also be making you friends. And these make us a lot of friends. So. The timing of things has been super important. And um, earlier in our career, when we, I think our first year really, we didn't quite appreciate that um, having plants for a longer amount of time was gonna be really important to having the maximum amount of sales. And so one of the things we're doing is we're constantly starting plants um, and starting them on a schedule to be available when people are going to want them. Um, and having the best looking plants when people are going to want them. And so for us, oftentimes that means throwing a lot of plants away um, or giving them to the food pantry or doing whatever we do with them. But um, we always want to be having the plants that look the best. So we have a couple different groups in terms of direct seeded crops. Um, three week plants or something like summer squash, cucumbers, winter squash. Um, all of our four week plants, lettuce, chard, all of the brassicas, beets, and tomatoes. And then the basil is a six week plant. So when we go to construct our seeding sheets, we're using all these as a guideline to make sure that we have the plants started on the day um, that we need to have the plants ready, if that makes sense. So for example, oops, let me go back. So for the onions and the leeks, um, we wait until the 21st of March to turn the greenhouse on. Um, for us, it's really cold and uh, it can be really dark at that time of the year. And so we found that the balance of temperatures coming up a little bit and the light coming back, really there's not a whole lot of value for us starting these any earlier than that. And we have actually at times waited until even April 1st to start our onions and leeks. Um, and they catch up. Um, they really... Uh, they gain so much ground as the sun returns and gains ground every day that um, I feel like we are always able to bring the plants that people are looking for. So we seed them into these 1203s, as I mentioned before, there's around 40 seeds per pack. We move them into the cold frame the last week of April um, and they're ready to go the first week of May. Um, so this is when they're emerging and this is, this is like a five week old plant. Um, it's pretty fast and um, they will continue to grow in these cells, you know, for a couple, three or four weeks. We'll have them probably for the first three weeks into May. Um, if we need to, we can trim the tops. We try, I try not to trim the tops um, if I don't have to, but um, it is a way to kind of, if you have some yellowing, you can kind of cut them uh, and make them look nice again. But we sell a lot of onions and leeks and um, 
I often, I know that it doesn't work this way, but the, oftentimes the sale of our onion and leek plants pays for the fuel for the farm. Um, and I, again, I, I know you can look at money any way you want, but that's, that's how I've chosen to look at it. Um, also growing the onions and leeks for people, they really appreciate it. It allows them access to the kinds of varieties that they may not have had before. A lot of people feel challenged by growing onions from seed um, because they're growing them under lights or they're growing them wherever in their house. And the only access to onion plants that they've had before is a set from the feed store. And so you can get a much better onion when you're growing it from seed. The breeding that goes into onions for seed is just much more um, on point as where commercial onions are being produced. So. Our peppers, we're starting them in open flats. Um, this is the Vermont Compost Fort V. We sift it through a quarter inch screen and then add in vermiculite at about an even measure. Um, and this makes a really friable germination mix. I want them to not be impeded in any way as they're trying to emerge. And when it comes time to prick them out, they, um, the soil just is really friable and just falls away from them as I'm picking them out of the tray. Um, I'm filling a flat and I'm tamping it down. And then these ridges uh, and valleys are made with a piece of tongue and groove flooring. And I'm typically getting 13 rows in this open seated tray. Um, I have tried like the 20 row germination trays that people have, that the people vote that you can get. And my experience is that the amount of soil that is there can dry out really quickly. And this allows me to um, walk away a little bit more frequently and not have to be so hands-on. Um, the, the full amount of soil just it preserves moisture a little bit better and I find it is more forgiving. Um, I make a point of mentioning in this book how many rows of any given variety I do um, so that if the tag gets misplaced, so this, there, each tag is kind of heads the row. If the tag gets knocked over or misplaced, I can kind of go back forensically and say, well, this one had three rows of King Crimson and a row of Ico Ico and two rows of this and kind of figure it out that way. Um, when I'm doing the mixes, I also try to make a point of figuring out what the mix will be from year to year and seed the peppers that I need in the mix all in one or two trays so that I can kind of work from this tray and do these three varieties and then work from this tray and do these three varieties and it cuts down on handling in the greenhouse and looking for trays and looking for flats and all those kinds of things. Um, once they're seeded, they go into this, my hillbilly germ chamber. Uh, it has a little milk house heater, a little electric heater in it. Um, I've seen people spend a lot of time and investment making a really nice germ chamber. I never did, but um, thought about it a lot and um, this one works great for me. So it's really just some old wood that I had and it's not even sided, it's wrapped in Reflectix. Um, and it keeps it about 85 degrees and the peppers typically pop in about five to seven days. It goes really fast. Um, once they're grown on for a little while, and these guys are a little bit further along, this is typically the size that I'm transplanting them out. They get moved into an 806. Um, they grow on for a while and then they're ready to sell on the third week of May. And I can hold them in these pots really until the second week of June. Um, and so that gives me a full month to sell them. And uh, that's from having them be in an 806. And they do get a little bit taller towards the end of their days, but um, the quality of the plant is still really strong. And they're, I wouldn't call them root bound. Um, that, you know, they're a mature plant, they're ready to go on the ground, but I feel okay about, about selling them. Tomatoes, we basically managed the same way as peppers. Started in an open tray, moved in um, to 804. They grow really fast, and we typically are selling a plant uh, that is at its fourth week. Um, and we do, you know, it's where we are, people talk about starting tomatoes weeks and weeks and weeks ahead of time, and um, I've just never found that to be the case. Again, like with the increase in light, um, they just grow really fast. and while sometimes the first time that I'm bringing this round of, of plants, they might be a little bit small, there's still so much in the, like the full on growth mode um, that even just a couple of days at the home, at the customer's 
garden or wherever they're wanting to plant them, they'll grow on and they just, there's such a nice time to be getting this plant. Um, we will typically plant up tomatoes three times. And so the first time we'll do, you know, the, the largest volume of them because we want to have them for the week before and the week of Memorial Day weekend, which is our prime time for tomato sales. Um, the second round is maybe like half as many plants. And then we'll do it, and that happens 10 days after we've seeded up or potted on these guys. And then the last one is another 10 days later. Uh, and that's about the 25% of the first planting. That one typically, we're really just doing some of the mixes, a few of the of cherries and smaller fruited ones and some of the well-known ones. We can't afford to keep all of them in stock. Um, but what we do is we just keep pulling the plants out of these seeded flats. Um, and while you do have to sometimes, you know, fold the stem down a little bit, um, there's still a lot of life in them. And once they get into some fresh soil, they take off and they can replant. And it means that we don't have to be managing another round of seeding in the open trays. Um, just one less thing to do, which is what I'm always looking for when it came to the greenhouse. It's just one less thing to do because there's always one more thing to do. So once all that's done, they have to get to the market. And this is typically, this is our display probably in, you know, this is probably like middle of June. Um, some of these guys are a little tall, so I'm gonna say it's the middle of June. Um, we have a pick list um, that tells us what needs to go to any given market. Um, it's based on what we had sold the previous years. Um, the van is outfitted with this rack. Um, if we're really bringing a lot of plants, all this market junk can go up on top of the van. It gives us four levels to put in plants. Um, you know, the one, the one up on the top is a little bit short, so we put cucurbits and things that are a little bit bendy up there. Um, but we can get a lot of flats of plants in this, in this van. Um, we oftentimes will run two loads into town. So I have a friend who lives uh, about a couple miles away from where our market has occurs, and she allows me to use her garage. And so if you look at here, there's the total. This is all the flats that were going to the market, and we split it up so that the first round of, of the van it's just these guys here and it goes down and unloads in my friend's garage. And then I come back and load the second round of, of plants. And we do it this way so that when we show up on Saturday morning, we have everything that we need to fully build the display in the van. So the, we, we show up, we hit our spot, we build our display with our benches and tables, and then we unload the van and set everything the way we want it to go. Um, and then that part is done then we can run up to the garage pick up this first round of plants which is now the second round of plants which is the backstock and run them back down to town and just get them in behind our space and not have to worry about where they're going to go because the display is already built um, and it just saves time and it's just the most efficient way for us to do it um, and again here's some pictures of the display um, you know there's we have three benches here um, everything that you could want to plant a garden, we have um, for these, particularly these weeks, the kind of jacket Memorial Day weekend. Um, I have a little movie here. And so here's the display. Um, you know, like that's, that's pretty cool. It's a lot of plants. Um, so everything we have has a sign. Um, it's super important that, to remove barriers from all of your customers. Um, and while it's never a good thing to say there's two kinds of people, there are folks who are comfortable asking you a question, and then there are folks who are uncomfortable asking you a question. And so my job is to remove the barrier for someone who doesn't want to ask me a question of what is this thing, and why do you like it, and why should I want to have it in my garden? And so by having signs on every variety, um, that kind of invites that person in and allows them to shop in a way that makes them feel comfortable. Um, so again, every, every plant has a sign. Um, we spend a lot of time on our signs, making them legible um, and uniform in terms of how they're presented. 
Um, I think sometimes that uh, the handwritten sign has a certain charm, but my handwriting is really horrible and uh, an approach is illegible at times. So this was the best way for me to do it. To do it on the computer, oftentimes it's late at re really late at night. Um, but I also laminate them all. This laminator is one of my favorite things in the whole wide world. I'm a man of many favorites, but um, if you spend the time to make signs, you should laminate them. Um, it's waterproof. You can use it over and over and over again. And um, again, it's, it doesn't cost that much. It was like 60 bucks um, and the pouches don't cost very much. And I just love it. So when we get to the market, we all try to have specific roles. Um, my role is to be the guy out front. Um, and I want to be making boxes. We, uh, we break down beer flats and then staple them back when we get to the market. They, they take up less space when they're broken down. So I'm the guy who's out front making boxes, asking questions. <clears throat> I'm restocking. Um, I am, so for this picture, you know, I've sold through a bunch of these plants. So I've come around the back and pushed them forward so that it's a full display from the front. Basically, I'm just fronting the display constantly um, and creating action when there isn't any and being available when there is action. Um, and I can manage the line as well. If someone is waiting in line, um, that could be a good thing. Um, if there's too many people in line, that can be a bad thing. So I can help someone who's got a couple plants and like take their money and send them out and help them on their way. Um, and just kind of keep things moving forward. Um, this is the view from the back. And so we try to keep it so you can walk through here and it's orderly. All the plants are kind of grouped by type. So when it comes time to restock, um, I can go find the plants that I'm looking for and grab them really quickly. Typically what I do is when there, it's down to one or two plants in a flat, I'll take that flat of one or two plants out and restock it with a full one and then condense them later to keep making full flats. But it's quicker just to put out a brand new one than to, than to replace the five or the four. Um, it just goes a lot faster. And again, it's really important to manage your line. Um, having this many people uh, is a gravity for other folks in the market. But if, uh, if it gets to be too busy, then um, some folks won't want to, to enter. So it's really important just to be thoughtful about that part. So, where do I want to go? So one of the last um, interactions that we have with our customers is the 4th of July parade in Cabot, Vermont. And so we create, well, we grow plants for folks for the 4th of July. They're specifically grown for the 4th of July. They're not leftover plants. Um, everyone has its own little tag. We cut up old uh, 806s. And um, honestly, it's one of my favorite days of the entire year. We walk through the parade in my truck, going as slow as we can, and 10 or 12 of us hand out plants to everybody. Um, last year, we held it, we handed out about <clears throat> 2,500 plants. Um, and so, while it's one of my favorite days of the year, it's also the last interaction we have with a lot of our customers is that we're giving them a gift. And, um, you know, we don't want anything for it. We're excited for them to have it. And it's a great way to kind of close that relationship with them for the season. So one of my favorite days. So I wanted to spend some time talking about the pricing. Um, these numbers are rooted in fact, but they are a little bit flexible. Um, and not all of them are going to be translatable. Um, certainly the the potting mix that I'm buying is pretty expensive. I know that it is possible to get potting mix for less per yard. And so that's a fairly easy one to adjust. Um, I, the first part of these prices are really just the cost that it takes to construct the flat and put it at its first place in the greenhouse. Um, and so for the onions, I'm typically spending $1.75 for the soil. And this is again in that 1203. The liner is 60 cents. Um, onion seeds are around five dollars per thousand. I'm shooting for about you know 500 seeds per per flat. Um, the pot sticks are about 65 cents. It takes a little bit longer to like make the dibbles and put the seeds in because it's a lot of repetitiveness on this onions in particular. 
um, the care is what I think of as watering the plants throughout the season, moving them into the cold frame, putting them onto the van and take, getting them to the market. Um, the heat is a little bit elevated because there's not as many flats for in the greenhouse at a time when they're um, heating, when I'm heating the greenhouse really actively. Um, so all to say though, I'm estimating the cost to be about $12.50 per flat. Um, all my packs sell for $4.25 a piece. There's 12 there, so it's a $51 flat. Um, and I'm netting like $38. Um, and that's how I can say that the the selling of the onions kind of pays for the heat because we sell a lot of onions and, and shallots and leeks. Um, and so shallots are a much more expensive seed. Um, you know, that we're talking $23 per M. So our seeded cost is about $11.50 per flat. So clearly it's, uh, when you're building these, it's like, it, 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 you know, I'm spending a lot of money on seed. But if you look at the net, like it's still a good return. Um, and I don't certainly do as many shallots as I do onions. It's oftentimes what would happen is someone would buy, you know, a couple flats of onions and a flat of leeks and a flat of shallots and then some lettuce and some other things. So um, I'm not spending all of, they're not spending all their money on shallots. I'm not spending all my time on shallots. They're just a part of what I'm doing. Um, and, I, and my customers really appreciate it. Lettuce is one that's really inexpensive to produce. Um, the seed cost is typically very low. Um, they're a four week plant, so their time in the greenhouse for heat is pretty low. Um, so again, the cost is really inexpensive. And I think this is a good way to cost any kind of open pollinated, lower cost seed. Um, and one could, I'm sure, I know that it's a fact that, that $5 for an M of lettuce seeds is actually even high in some cases. Um, there's lots of varieties that are much less expensive for that, but at some point the cost, the difference between 20 cents and 10 cents is only 10 cents. Um, and I, I kind of feel like you're just kind of tripping over pennies. So just to say that there's a lot of, a lot of value in this kind of a plant. Um, similarly, with the shallots to the, to the onions, you know, Bell Star broccoli at $22 an M is a much more expensive seed, but the actual seed cost per tray is really not that expensive. Um, and the value, the net value of that flat is still really high against the costs. And so I'm just, the whole point of this is to say that when I'm offering my customers like higher cost, higher value hybrids, um, they're, it's, we're both coming out ahead because I'm still making good money and they're getting a much val better value of a plant that's gonna perform better for them and, and all that kind of good stuff. So, and then to make, oh, what, here we go. There we go, rats, we'll figure it out. There we go, so for tomatoes, um, a little bit more labor to construct them. They have to be seeded initially and then pricked out. Um, so I bumped the labor up. Um, and that's really more of a reflection of how many I can do of the mixes. Um, if I'm just doing a regular tray of like a, a, the same variety of tomatoes, I can burn through them really fast and that labor would go down probably by half. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of value, there's a lot of, of return in a flat of tomatoes and everyone loves tomatoes. Um, I actually think that I sell more of all the other stuff than I do of tomatoes. It doesn't take, but, you know, a couple packs of tomatoes to fill a garden, um, but people buy a lot more broccoli and lettuce and those kinds of things, and kale and collards um, that they're kind of buying throughout the season. Um, so I think I make more money on all the other things too. So it's all not without problems, right? Um, aphids are certainly a problem, and I have wrestled with them in the past. Um, the one time that they struck me the hardest was the season when I did not do a good job the year before of cleaning the greenhouse out. Um, it was the grass and the weeds that were kind of at the edges of the greenhouse served as a place for them to overwinter. And when I cranked the heat on in the spring and then planted seedlings, they moved on to them. And um, if you have never seen exponential growth, uh, it's a pretty shocking thing to see. They're born pregnant and they can completely explode. 
Um, so my MO moving forward uh, was to, I had to, I was inspecting almost every plant before it left the farm and it drove me almost bonkers. It was super frustrating and it was morally really, morale was really crushing. Um, it was super frustrating. And so my MO now is as soon as I see any aphids, I spray that area with soap and I take them that spot out of the greenhouse. I'll take the flat out of the greenhouse. They um, have epicenters. And if I can remove the epicenter, I can slow the tide. And so I'm constantly scouting for them. Um, the ladybirds are effective, but my experience has been that the plants cycle through the greenhouse so fast that um, they're not as effective because they're just not there for as long. Um, I have definitely struggled with maggots, um, both seed corn maggot and cabbage maggot, onion maggots as well. Um, and I treat them with a predatory nematode. Um, I get a blend of HBSC. Um, I can't remember which is which, but one of the H, one of them is a pouncer and one of them is a, is a waiter or a hunter. Um, and they are pretty effective. Um, you can spray them over the plants and water them in and they'll clean up the maggots pretty quickly. They'll also take care of the fungus gnat maggot. Um, I've had trouble with cucumber beetles and I use Remay for them. I also use the Remay for the leaf miners. Um, the problems on the right are more um, cultural. And so by managing water, you can kind of address problems with edema and damping off and molds. Um, I don't have pictures and I haven't mentioned, but using horizontal airflow flan, fans, HAF, um, to keep the air moving through the greenhouse is super important. Um, it's good for the plants, it kind of toughens them up a little bit and controls their growth, but it also creates a place, it, it just dries them out and the air moving through the greenhouse kind of disincentivizes the molds to get started. Um, the other problem would be having too many plants, um, and that's a problem that we've always kind of struggled with. Um, a little bit of overproduction, I think, is ultimately a good thing because, again, you're always going to have the plants that you want to bring your customers the best quality plant. Um, but uh, you can certainly go a little bit overboard. And early in our career, we had to throw away a terrific amount of plants. And by making notes on those sheets of how many we were bringing back at the end of every market, we were able to tailor how many we were creating. Um, and that was a way to kind of address the overproduction piece. Um, I didn't put them on here, but rodents, we definitely struggle with rodents at times. Um, we use traps. Um, we have also put um, certain plants at various stages of their lives in cages that fit on the benches. Um, and oftentimes when peppers are at their seedling stage, when they're in those open trays, they're really attractive to mice. And so I built like a cage that holds those. Um, and then I use a lot of mouse traps. They really like sage for some reason. And so oftentimes I will use sage on some peanut butter or I'll use some cucumber seeds on some peanut butter as a way to trap them. Um, but we definitely have struggled with, with mice and chipmunks as well. Chipmunks are incredibly destructive. Um, and I, I have a air rifle. I don't like to shoot gunpowder inside the greenhouses, but I have an air rifle um, that can address them as well. Um, this is a list of some of the suppliers that I've used. Griffin Greenhouse Supplies, they use my, I get my hard goods from them, the liners. The Monk Compost Company uh, is the potting mix and compost. Uh, my seed source is typically high mowing, Johnny's, Fedco, and Seed Savers. Farm tech, I get a lot of the infrastructure, fans, blowers, um, hoses, and those kinds of things. Um, Jaderloon is another greenhouse company in North Carolina, and I'll, I get some specialized parts for them, and I'll show them in a little bit. Ripped Sheets is the place where I get my labels, uh, my pot sticks, and then Arbico Organics is the place where I get the HBSC nematodes and they now have them on a sticker or in a media that is uh, OMRI approved for a certified organic farm, which is pretty cool. So I want to talk about a couple of my favorite things. I'm a man of many favorites. Um, 
This is my hose trolley. It runs down the center of the greenhouse. It would be really nice to have one that ran down each aisleway um, and maybe someday, but um, having it down the middle, um, I can reach all the corners. Um, it does a couple of things. It keeps the hose off the floor, which is really nice and not cutting around corners and I'm not like tracking dirt and making just mess and muck. Um, but it also just, it, it, it's just a better way to do it. It's up, it's up on the ground. You're not called, you're not dragging dirt and everything. It's just, it's the way I like to do it. Um, I also have this little T here. And so I have a hose that comes off and so I can water the seedling bench here with a faucet that's dedicated with a, like a lighter nozzle. And then when I'm walking down the greenhouse, I can do this kind of like a larger amount of watering. We also, we water all the greenhouses with warm water. Um, and if you can imagine, if, you, if you're living like a plant and you've been growing in this lovely greenhouse all day, and then someone comes around and throws water on you that's 50 degrees, it's pretty traumatizing. And so by using this plate exchanger, which is tied into the boiler, I can condition the water. So the water that I'm watering the plants with uh, is coming out at like between 75 and 80 degrees and the plants actually love it. Um, not everyone has a boiler, I appreciate that, um, but if you have access to a hot water heater, um, it might be good to bring a hot water heater into the operation. Even um, an on-demand hot water heater would be a great thing. You can dial the temperature for whatever you want, um, and it just makes such a difference in the quality of the plants. This is my hillbilly germ chamber. We talked about it a little bit. It's, uh, it's, in a, it's a great part of the operation and you can make it as fancy or as hillbilly as this one, um, but de definitely worth having. And then this is one of my favorite things. Um, this is a trolley, overhead trolley. Um, I built the, this, I built the cart itself um, out of some stock that I got from a rolling bench there is uh, a ring of pipe that encircles the inside of the, oops, circles inside the greenhouse. Um, and so you can walk this plant, this tray full of plants from one greenhouse to the other. Um, and actually when we were just building it, so you can see like here, it doesn't even finish the loop. Um, but when we were used to it, you can like push this thing ahead of yourself um, and just kind of walk behind it. Um, it's amazing. If you're seeding into a tray, you can put uh, eight trays on each one of these levels. So it's like 20 something flats. Um, it goes really fast. Um, and it was incredible how much it cut down the time when we were moving plants. We would spend hours taking plants from the greenhouse to the cold frame. And now we can put uh, 12 flats on at once and just kind of like walk it down the aisle faster than you can carry two. Um, so the, I built, I bent all the pipe using like the tractor as a fulcrum and made the curves. Um, the parts that I bought from Jaderloon are these little hooks here. Um, there, this is also a system that's used in dry cleaners. Um, this pipe here allows me to take the trolley out of this greenhouse and then run it over to the cold frame. Um, this is another shot of how this, it hangs. And so this is just one inch conduit that I, you know, hit with a hammer to flatten it out, drilled a hole, used a pipe clamp, um, and then cut it to length. And then again, built all this stuff with 1.3 inch uh, purlin pipe. Um, and I have a video that I'll post on the Insta. I can't get it to work on this presentation, but it's the, a tray, the trolley full of plants leaving the greenhouse, going around the corner and going down the cold frame. And it makes loading the truck so much easier. It's, it's epic, epic. Um, and it took me a little bit of time to build, but it's, it was so worth it. It paid for itself in like less than a day. So um, that's it. And I will turn to some questions on the thing, but I really appreciate the chance to be visiting with y'all. It's super cool. And so let me grab this thing here yeah thanks paul that was that was fantastic cool yeah a lot of um, great detail and yeah there were definitely some questions that came through um 
And so if you want to look through those and try and check some of them off, you can. Otherwise, I can feed them to you, whatever you're comfortable with. Yep, yeah, I, gra I grabbed the thing. Okay. So um, do I use biochar in your potting soil mixes? Um, I don't. Um, it may be that some is added at the point of manufacture. Um, that is something that we could ask Vermont Compost Company. It is a fortified potting mix. And so there is green sand and um, I know that there's bone char. I don't know that he's using biochar, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if he does incorporate that somehow. He's a pretty thoughtful guy and really thinks about the, like the architecture of his potting soils and particularly the process with which he's constructing his compost. It's uh, not a monomineral. He's bringing in food scraps and mixing them with um, donkey and cow manure and then grazing chickens on it. So the chickens are kind of clawing through the food scraps and incorporating it in. So it's, it's a pretty amazing um, thoughtful approach to making the basis of the hot mixes. So only to say that I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't put, I wouldn't be surprised if he does have some biochar in. Yeah. Paul, while we're on that topic too, I was curious. So um, yeah, we, I do know some people who get Vermont compost company here in Iowa, you know, we don't have it 30 miles down the road, so we have to pay for the shipping, but yeah, um, it's nice that you have that resource there. But you mentioned, I think maybe when you were talking about the peppers, about um, you know mixing it with some vermiculite. Do you do that yes. with all your with all uh, starts or just with the peppers? Or would you clarify a little bit about um, yep. you know using that the a seed starting mix from them and then any mixes you do for specific varieties? Sure. And so the I'm really just using the vermiculite for the germinating mix. And so anything that's being seeded, like peppers and tomatoes, where I'm seeding them into an open tray and then taking the plants out after they've germinated and grown their first few leaves and potting them on, that's in the mix. Okay. One of the things about the Fort V is that it tends to um, occasionally clump together and uh, it can be hard sometimes for a seed, well, I really want them to not have to fight their way out of the potting mix. And when I go to separate them, I want the potting mix to be super friable. And so by adding the vermiculite, it gives me a mix that like doesn't have any kind of like clumping. Like the Fort V was developed for people who want to also be making soil blocks. Yeah. Fibers are such that you can compact it and it will hold its shape. And I wanted it to not have that ability or tendency. So the vermiculite allows it to just become completely friable. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. For the for amount, that. Yeah. For the amount of, of mix that I need, it doesn't make sense to buy another mix because I'm already buying like 12 yards of the Fort V or whatever, you know, eight yards of the Fort V. And so um, I can just sift it out and then use what doesn't make through the sifter in the bottom of a three and a half inch pot, or I could throw it out the door or whatever. It doesn't really matter, but um, it's a way of just make, of making that little piece a custom thing. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I, I feel like I answered the insects, slugs, and rodents. In yeah, that pest point. question, I was just gonna yeah. clear that. You did get to um, that. I don't, I haven't had trouble with slugs in the greenhouse. Um, everything is up on a bench and the, there isn't a really um, hospitable way for a slug to get up the bench to where the plants are being produced. Um, and even in a cold frame, they're still, you know, they're a couple of three feet off the ground and I do keep the sides somewhat mown. It's not certainly like a kill strip, but there's, um, I try to keep them clean and trim. So there's, there's not like a, a good way for the slugs to get to the plants. Um, so have you seen, this from Eric, have you seen any indication that the density of seedlings from day zero germination to three to four weeks has a permanent effect on the eventual end size of the plant? Will a plant grown densely at germination preemptively place a cap on its eventual growth potential despite all transplant spacing and nutrients applied later? Um, I guess, Yes and no. It depends on how quickly 
you give it the chance to not be right next to its neighbor. So, um, and so for example, if I, it, the picture that I had of the trays with the tomatoes that have been growing for a little bit longer that I was pulling subsequent movings from, um, those guys are, you know, as, as little as an eighth of an inch apart from each other. And once they are removed from that open cell and put into their own four pack, they flourish. And so um, I think if you never moved them on, they would certainly feel crowded and wouldn't be able to do their thing. But they really, the plants want to grow. And I think that sometimes they're willing to wait. Um, you know, you can certainly see a situation um, in the field where beets or radishes, if they aren't thinned, they'll get a sense of their neighbors and they won't be able to overtake that sense of their neighbors. And oftentimes that's because they are the part of the plant that you're trying to utilize is the root. And so when that root um, is butted up against its neighbor, it's, it starts to change its shape um, and won't really grow on beyond that. But I think for the plants that I'm growing, if you can give them the space, they'll, they'll recover from that initial crowding. Does that answer the question, I think? I think that answers the question. I think so, yeah. Too many words, but I apologize. <laughs> um, is it too inefficient for you to generate your own seed economically? Um, this is from Eric. Yes and no. Um, and so it depends on a couple of different things. And, and so, and I'll, and, I'm, and I'll spend a little bit of time answering this. So early in my career, I was a seed grower also for high mowing seeds, as, as well as doing market vegetables. And I found that it was a real challenge to maintain both of those endeavors well. And it was certainly a part, it was earlier in my career, and I wasn't as good at managing um, competing uh, priorities as well as I am later in my career. Um, I also found that it was complicated energetically. You know, the seed thing was happening later in the season, and I really just wanted to be checking things off my list and be done. And so it was hard for me to find the energy to care about managing this one more seed crop. Um, all that said, I have some friends who are up in Canada, and one of the parts of their operation is growing seeds for their farm. And they've spent a lot of time finding ways to do smaller productions that have you know, um, adaptability to their region and they can also grow them in a way that doesn't um, like impact the day-to-day -day operation of their vegetable operation. They really are um, committed to having that full circle happening at their farm. But in terms of the actual amount that they're saving, she says it's like 2%, or she said it was actually 1.8% of their budget. Um, so in terms of the amount of money that they're saving by growing some numbers of seeds, I think it's probably actually costing them more. Um, but they've chosen to make that be a part of their operation. Um, so for me, and for full disclosure, I work at a seed company. So um, I, in growing the farm, decided that there were things that I could do really well, and then there were things that I wanted someone else to do really well. And so, for example, the potting mix, like I could certainly have gone down the road of making my own potting mix and probably could have gotten good at it, but I decided that by giving that job to Carl Hammer, there was ways that I could spend my time doing other things that only I could do at the farm. And so the same kind of thing with me for seeds, like there are people who wake up in the morning figuring out ways to grow better seed and to grow new varieties. And so I want to serve, I want those folks to be rewarded for taking on that work and I want to support that work. So um, one can do all different kinds of things. For me, it was just a amount of how many things that I could do at any one time. So. I think that answers the question. And I'd be happy to talk more about it. If it, if it doesn't answer the question, let me know. Um, and so Carl asks, what is the service life of a laminated sign? Um, I would say years. Um, I would keep them in a, uh, a check folder 
you know, like one of the things that has a rubber band around it. Um, and I would group them by variety. Um, and I found that my signs lasted for years and years and years. The one thing I would do is that they were laminated in a pouch. And so the pouch has a joined edge and then an open end. And I would do it in such a way that the, the part that was joined went through the thing first um, so that it was facing down. So that when I was sticking in the little holders, it wasn't tearing apart the part that was not like seam fitted at the factory. I'm not explaining myself very well. Um, only to say that the pouches lasted for years. Um, and I felt like one rain on an unlaminated sign kind of ruined that sign and they would flop over, um, but they could get rained on and they can get watered on in a plant sale. And I left them outside when I was set up the plant sales at, at the farm and they'd be outside for the whole week and, and they did great. Um, thank you, Carl. Um, Eric, are you watering seedlings with hard well water? Um, yes, it is. Uh, it's harder water. I haven't tested the pH, um, but it is well water. Um, I do know that it claw, you know, I get some calcification on some of my nozzles, especially the smaller misters, uh, but I don't know what the pH is. Um, I never felt like the plants were suffering for the water. Um, especially, I think that heating the water made a big difference. Um, and so, but I, but I can't really speak to the hard water part. Um, so L. Kraus, how do you seed the trays? I actually used one of those little green plastic tap seeders. We didn't have a vacuum seeder. Um, the, we did so many different things that it was really fast just to use those little tap seeders. Um, and I also just got really good at rolling the seeds out of my fingers. Um, I know it sounds minorly absurd. There's so much um, with the slide seeders and the vacuum seeders, um, but for the amount, we did so many mixes of things um, and so many different things that the, I never felt like the, the high, what am I trying to say? All of that, the automated stuff works really well if you're doing like 30 flats of this and 25 flats of this and 40 flats of this, but we were doing like three flats of this and two of this and one of this and one of this. And it just felt like the setup and the breakdown and the cleaning in between varieties was going to negate any of the saving. So we just did it by hand. Um, and so the onions, so how we seed the trays, especially small seeded things like onion and lettuce. The same thing, we used um, the tap seeder um, and we would allow ourselves to be a little bit loose with the numbers. Um, you know, so when we were doing the basils, we would go for like four seeds per tray, per cell, excuse me. Um, and you could get to the place where if you held the, you know, the, the little plastic green sewing tap seeder and you turn it to five and it only like you know, a third of it is open and you turn it on an angle so you're keeping the kind of flat and you're tapping it, like only two or three seeds will come out and you can get pretty good at it. Um, and so we also try to get pelleted seeds whenever we could, even if we were seeding them by hand, it made a big difference, um, especially pelleted lettuces. Um, they're easier to see and easier to meet out, so. Um, materials for the tray tables. All the benches, I used expanded metal as the tops. Um, and I used, an, I had an expanded metal that was rolled so that it didn't have a bias on it. So that, only to say that it was completely flat. Um, and I just built them on two by fours. Um, and then I used um, an electric staple, you know, you know, for nailing up Romex that didn't have the plastic on it. So you could nail it in flat. Um, and it meant that I could, shoot the, the trays across the benches and spin them around and take them from both sides. They didn't get caught on anything. Um, and the center bench was four foot by 10 foot. And then on the bench on the right is a five foot wide bench. And then the bench on the left um, was a four foot bench. So in a 22 foot greenhouse, I had 19 feet of benches, which left me about three feet of sidewalk um, for the aisles. Um, and that was when 
having the trolley was really special because it's hard to walk sideways really fast when you're carrying plants, but if you're putting them on a rack and just giving them a push, it's much easier to go really fast when you're walking sideways. Um, and do I use any fertilizers? There would be times when I would use um, fish and kelp as a drench. Um, it was pretty unusual to have to do that though. One of the great things about the Fort V is that it had enough fertility really to carry the plant to its sale. Um, and that was also one of the reasons though that I used the deep for the basil and the peppers, like that extra amount of soil made a big difference. Um, the only other time that I would use a product, I would use um, Compost Plus, which is another thing from Vermont Compost Company. And it is a, a compost product with some blood meal and some green sand that is highly soluble. And so you can just kind of broadcast it on top of the plants and water it in and boost them up. It makes, it, it makes them turn around pretty quickly. And so oftentimes onions would be heavy feeders and they would start to run out of juice a little bit. And so I would give them some compost plus or I would give them some fish and kelp and water them in. But most everybody else didn't really need it. It was, um, that was one of the, the best things about the Ford B is it, it really had everything in it that it needed to have. I think that's all the questions. Yeah, fantastic, Paul. So we have just a few more minutes with Paul. If anybody's got another question that you want to put in the chat box, now's your last chance to do that. Um, Paul, w one thing I wanted to ask you about uh, before we let you go is a little bit about, a little bit more about your marketing. And, um, and obviously you've spent a lot of time and built up a great customer base at your local farmer's market. Have you explored growing plant starts for other vegetable farms or for any other outlets? I mean, there's obviously other growers at the farmer's market. Have you ever, you know, sold them some onions or anything like that? Have you gotten into that realm at all? Um, yes and no. I, um, I have certainly like helped a buddy out at the farmer's market and given them some plants. Um, I wanted to explore some wholesale markets and, um, there was, because uh, I thought that would be a great way to kind of potentially buffer. I wouldn't necessarily be sending just over production. I would be planning for the growth there um, and was in conversation with a store that I really wanted to be servicing. And um, through a series of unfortunate events in between the conversation that I was having with the buyer, another grower approached them and the person actually thought that she was signing a contract with me and signed the contract with the other grower and he scooped the account. And it was like 100% innocent. I harbor no ill will, um, but it would have been a great account. And I think that we could have serviced it, serviced it really well. Um, in my part of the world, most folks run their own greenhouses and produce their own plants. And so I certainly made overproduction available for someone that had a problem. Um, but I, I chose that to, um, I rarely wanted money from those folks, you know, because there are times where I was in a pinch and folks helped me out. And so I felt it was uh, a, a great way to provide a plan for someone else who was in a tight spot. So. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Good to know. Well, it looks like, uh, it looks like that is the last of the chat box there. So, um, uh, everybody thanks for tuning in tonight and joining us and and especially Paul thank you so much for taking the time to to share your inside knowledge with us that was a absolutely no it was really my pleasure neat glimpse and, into what you do yeah and I'm a processor and so um, my questions don't always come to me and so I included my contact information here and please if anyone has questions that come to them later like really don't hesitate to shoot me an email and I'll do my best to answer any questions that are available yeah, that's fantastic. We really appreciate that. So um, thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And, Paul, hopefully someday we can, you know, our, our paths will cross, and, uh, and we'll see you around then. That'll be super fun. I look forward to it. All Thank right. You so much. Have a good night, everyone.